Hello, welcome to Stanford Care's monthly community health talk series. My name is Dr. Justin Lee, and I'm a general cardiologist and also your moderator for tonight. I'm really pleased to bring to you this series of talks co-sponsored by Stanford Health Library and the Winston V. C. Wu Foundation. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Ellen Young, who will be speaking on changing your heart valve through your leg. Is it will? or fake news. Changing a worn-out heart valve, specifically the aortic valve, through the leg artery without bypass and avoiding the need to open up the chest may seem like a storyline from a science fiction. However, since 2008, we have been at the forefront of this cutting-edge technology at Stanford, having successfully performed over 2,600 of these procedures. In most of these cases, patients are able to return home the day after the procedure, resuming their normal activities with minimal restriction or discomfort. The incidence of worn out heart valves typically rises in the eighth decade of life, given the longevity of Asian women and men. This condition is relatively common in our community. Unfortunately, uh, it is often overlooked or misunderstood, especially among the elderly. Both the patients and their family frequently believe it is too late or too risky to replace the valve. And there is also a cultural aversion among Asians towards undergoing open heart procedures. In this discussion, Dr. Ellen Young will shed light on a specific condition known as aortic stenosis. The treatment known as transcatheter aortic valve replacement or tougher, and its outcomes, particularly among the Asian population. Dr. Ellen Young is a highly experienced, world-renowned interventional cardiologist. He is board certified in interventional cardiology, cardiovascular diseases, and internal medicine. He completed his fellowship training in cardiology at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. He is currently the Lee Carsing Professor in Cardiology at Stanford University School of Medicine. He was also the past chief of cardiology at Stanford. Dr. Yuan provides care for a very wide range of cardiovascular disorders, such as coronary artery disease and different valvular heart disorders. He performs different procedures, including transcatheter aortic valve replacement, cardiac catheterization, and percutaneous coronary intervention, as well as balloon valvuloplasty. Dr. Yuan also conducted numerous research studies as a principal investigator and co-investigator. He has researched the placement of transcatheter aortic valve, the use of device to help with ventricular compliance, and the use of a vascular scaffold to treat coronary artery stenosis. He has received research grants both from the industry as well as from the NIH. Dr. Yuan also published his research findings in more than 300 peer-reviewed articles in high-impact journals such as Jack and Circulation. Please welcome Dr. Ellen Yang. Really nice to have to, to share this uh, evening with all of you uh, to talk about a topic that is really, um, really dear to my heart because I think of my in my career this is probably one of the most important breakthrough technology that benefit to many of our patients. So Justin uh, has introduced a topic already. It sounds like science fiction that you can change a pretty a big piece of heart valve through the leg. So I would hopefully share with you that indeed this is real. And we have been doing this at Stanford for the last uh, 18, um, close to 18 years. This is my conflict of interest. Um, I've received grant support from some of the companies that make these um, graphs, but this is under a sort of a, a multi-center study. So it's hard for me to influence any of these results. So what is actually um, how the heart works? So I think it's important to understand that the heart valves, there are four of them, essentially allows the heart to receive blood from the body, which um, essentially go through this part of the, uh, what we call superior vena cava into the right atrium, the top part of the heart, and pumps it through into the lung. Because the blood returning from the body has been used up in terms of oxygen and nutrients. So we, we showed it here as blue. So once it gets to the lung, the lung through breathing will add oxygen to the blood and turn it red. 
So the blood, blood is returned back to the left side of the heart through the left atrium, through a valve called mitral valve, and then through uh, the aortic valve. The left ventricle is the main pumping chamber of the heart, which you see on TV. The heart is you know, pumping on, on, a, on a cartoon, for example. That's the ventricle that pumps the blood out. So the aortic valve allows blood to go through and go to the head, for example, and then down the aorta into the rest of the body, to kidneys, to liver, to your gut, to your legs. So really important for this valve to work because if the valve is not working, blood is not coming out from the left ventricle. So what is aortic stenosis? So this valve, um, when it is healthy, is really thin. And when it's closed, it's completely closed, so it would not leakage, so the blood would not come back from the aorta. And when it opens, it's pretty much completely open, so it's a big hole. So the heart has very little resistance to pump the blood through this valve into the aorta. However, if you have a diseased aortic valve, usually because of the buildup of calcium, as you age, because this valve is open and closed, open and closed for you know 60 to 100 beats per minute for you know, let's say 70 years, 80 years, and this valve essentially will build up calcium thickened. And now it may not close completely, leaks a little bit, but more importantly, it cannot open. So when it cannot open, the hole where the blood has to come out becomes much smaller. So what happened is the left ventricle, this pumping chamber, has to work much harder to pump the blood through this small hole. So essentially it's asking you, for example, to breathe through a straw. You have to breathe much harder to push the, uh, the air out. So the heart has been working gradually more heavily over many years when this valve gets a little bit smaller. Obviously, it's a very serious condition that can uh, weaken the heart because the ventricle can eventually um, sort of say, well, it's, I've been working too hard for too long and therefore start to weaken and cannot pump blood anymore. Then you can develop a condition and get heart failure. So what are the causes and risk factors for the aortic stenosis? Not everyone gets it. So why would some people get it and some people don't? So the causes are obviously, as I said, calcium buildup, but also sometimes uh, people were born with a valve that is not completely symmetric. For example, here you can see three leaflet, very equally distributed around a circle, but some people have actually valves that are slightly unequal in size. And some people will have valves that are stuck, meaning that instead of three leaflet, this for example here is fused and therefore becomes what we call bicuspid valve, meaning there's only two leaflet functioning as if it's a fish mouth. The fish mouth is uh, okay when you're young, when it's completely open, but the fish mouth unfortunately tends to narrow it up faster because the blood flowing through it is not smooth and therefore can trigger buildup of calcium even faster. So sometimes people have rheumatic fever as a child or have radiation therapy through the chest can cause damage to the valve and ca causes acceleration of the aortic stenosis. The risk factors are when you get older, this condition is more common because just the wear and tear. High blood pressure can cause the valve to thicken as well because more pressure is going through the valve. And also high cholesterol seems to do some damage to the valve as well. Smoking, and as I said before, you were born with a congenital valve that is two leaflets and not instead of three. So the valve obviously takes time for me to get from a healthy uh, three leaflets, become mildly thickened to moderately thickened and severely thickened, limiting the opening of the valve. It's therefore, it's a progressive condition. And therefore, what can be done? Not a whole lot of things can be done medicine-wise. You know, there's been studies trying to show that lowering cholesterol can help, but it turns out if you study a large enough patient, cholesterol lowering doesn't really do very much for the aortic stenosis progression. So when so what what is the the sort of the the magnitude or how big is the problem is aortic stenosis? As you know, um, the number of patient a number of people in the world that you know reaches age sixty five and uh, and and higher, probably we double by twenty fifty. So the whole global population, whether it's China, whether it's U.S., whether it is uh, India and in, and in, in Japan, for example, worldwide is likely to grow from about 0.7 billion in 2020 to more than 1.5 billion in 2050. So 1.5 billion people that are basically age older than 65. And again, uh, in America, the similarly large number of Americans will be 65 years and older.
So this condition uh, tends to occur in age 70, 65 70 to sort of 80. And you can see that with whether it's severe aortic stenosis or moderate aortic stenosis, meaning the narrowing is not uh, severe yet, as you can see, can increase in age. You might say, well, how come greater than 80 doesn't increase further? The, obviously, the part of the reason is that, you know, the average sort of uh, mean age in the U.S. is probably, um, so life expectancy is about, you know, low 80s. So therefore, obviously, some of the patients up here has uh, unfortunately disease because of other conditions. So therefore, the incidence is definitely higher, especially say we can see the severe ones certainly is higher in the age, older age group. So this is a serious condition, meaning that if you have this problem and it's severe, and I'll explain that in a little bit, what does it mean by severe? You have about a 50% chance of living two years without aortic valve uh, uh, replacement. The reason is that the heart usually by this point is pretty tired. And therefore any uh, sort, of, um, sort of years of not replacing the valve will lead to the heart muscle further we weakening and further weakening leading to heart failure sometimes is irreversible, meaning the muscle is so tired that even if you change the valve, the, the heart muscle is not going to come back. It's not going to repair itself because essentially it had been um, working too hard and therefore getting some scarring and therefore difficult to, um, to go back to normal. So you may say, well, okay, um, you have this valve that is narrowing over time. So what do patients actually feel? Because this is one of the most important a set of questions when patients come to see me about aortic stenosis is that, do you have symptoms? Because obviously uh, when you are older, we want to make sure that when we do a procedure, it will improve your quality of life besides making you live longer. So typical symptoms that patients may have with severe aortic stenosis include fatigue, shortness of breath, and some sort of chest pain. Sometimes they have difficult walking short distances without getting very short of breath or tired. And sometimes they get a little rapid heartbeat, swelling their legs, and don't want to do things that you want to do, and feeling dizzy um, or getting lightheaded and difficult sleeping. Obviously, some of the later ones are quite um, vague. So we obviously need to sort of talk to the patients in great detail, what are these symptoms? So usually sometimes you go sort of, uh, the, the, many patients, because they're getting older, they say, well, I'm just getting old, therefore I'm tired. But obviously difficult for the patient himself or herself to know whether this is normal, uh, worsening as, as part of aging, or this is actually worse. So that's why it's helpful, obviously, to talk to patients and their family to notice how quick is the change. So I think that's why uh, it is sometimes uh, difficult to, to talk to the patient alone, and talking to the family uh, is very helpful because they can sense a, a greater decline than they would sort of normally expect. So the question is, how can you get diagnosed of aortic stenosis? You know, if traditionally, uh, if you go see a physician or doctor that, you know, the first thing they do obviously can check your blood pressure, check different things. And also hopefully they still use a th stethoscope to listen to your heart sound. So usually by listening to your heart, you would detect a murmur if you have aortic stenosis and a certain location of the murmur um, will point towards the aortic valve. So unfortunately, um, the stethoscope is pretty um, sort of vague in terms of how bad is the aortic stenosis. Sometimes a aortic stenosis that's not severe can make a very loud murmur. And sometimes the aortic stenosis um, is severe to critical and the murmur is relatively soft. The reason partly is that blood starts to not flow so well when you have very severe aortic stenosis, making the sound maybe a little weaker. So what is the best way to check whether the aortic stenosis, the murmur is uh, significant. And this is done by an ultrasound. So this is echocardiography. So essentially it's like looking at babies and this is using ultrasound to look at the heart as it beats. And you can use sound wave to produce an image of the heart. And then you can closely examine the aortic valve. What we can measure is the pressure difference between the left ventricle and the aorta. So as you can imagine, when there's no blockage in the valve, the blood just flow right through the valve and there was no pressure difference on this one side of the aorta or one side of the left ventricle. However, if the aortic valve gets smaller and smaller in its opening, the heart left ventricle is pump harder and harder and need a greater pressure to push the blood out. So therefore, if the pressure difference becomes reaches 40 millimeters of mercury, that would become a critical number that we have to, we should consider 
changing the valve. So for example, if the blood pressure is 120 in the arm, the left ventricle may reach an average of 40 millimeters or more than the blood pressure. That's the time when we start thinking about changing the valve. So just to summarize, when we think about aortic stenosis, there are two big pieces of information that we need from the patient and from test. One is that we want to know whether the patient has symptoms. And symptoms could be subtle, could be very uh, obvious. And it's the job of the cardiologist to, and the patient and the patient's family to try to discuss whether there are symptoms. Second is that how severe is the aortic stenosis and that's best done by echocardiography. And what we're looking for simply is that the difference between two sides of the valve, the aortic, the aorta on one side, left ventricle on the other side, and it reached the difference reaches an average of 40 millimeters of mercury. Some the valve is now reaching to be a, a severe stage. So once we know that, and fortunately, unfortunately, medicine doesn't work too well. This is a very mechanical problem, meaning as if your 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 kitchen sink is plugged. You can't really you can use Drano in that situation. Unfortunately, there's no such thing in medicine that can can do that that you can take into the blood without destroying the blood and everything else. So unfortunately, medicine may help to treat some of the milder symptoms. Um, to sort of um, prolong the time that you have to wait for this uh, valve surgery. So medicine, unfortunately, doesn't contribute a whole lot to the treatment in the long run. So before uh, uh, 2012 in the U.S., even though we start doing research of this particular procedure, of I'll explain later, in 2008, but the valve procedure through the leg is actually approved in 2012. But before that, the only way to do that is what we call a surgical aortic valve replacement, SABR. So surgical aortic valve replacement called SABR is essentially, um, there are two approaches. Essentially, both of them have to go open up the, the chest wall and expose the heart. Traditionally, um, it's, it's a long incision along the sternum because then you can open up the sternum and look at the heart. Or nowadays, you can also have a very relatively smaller incision to access the heart in, in the top part of the chest. But nevertheless, the whether it is the traditional longer incision or shorter incision, the it is really the cosmetic part, right? The, the actual pr uh, procedure requires a heart lung machine. Why do you need a heart lung machine? Because you have to stop the heart to do the valve. If the heart is not stopped, you know, when you cut into the aorta, for example, it will be obviously bleeding everywhere. It's not possible. So you have to divert the blood into a heart lung machine and then stop the heart. And then the disease aortic valve is completely removed and a new valve is sewn in. So it's sewn in like a seamstress. So it basically has a sewing ring and you sew it into the uh, where the old valve was. Typically, um, the procedure may be you know, a total of three to four hours. Um, and But you typically stay in the hospital for about a week, maybe four days in the intensive care and a few more days in the in the ward before you go home. Obviously, it depends on the patients, uh, uh, how well they are and how old they are. And then average after that, um, you know, the recovery is about 30 days, meaning after you go home, um, so you're still kind of weak, the chest is hurting and you're a little anemic. There might be some arrhythmia or an extra beats in the heart. So typically it take about um, 30 days for you to go back to feeling uh, pretty normal. And the risk uh, in general is about 3% of um, experience stroke or death because this is a big operation uh, at one year. So this sounds like at least between before um, you know 2012, it's a great procedure. The risk is, you know, young healthy people, younger healthy people is really less than 1%. But at least 40% of the patients who um, really who need a valve replacement do not get treatment. It's done by a lot of these studies before 2012. In green here is really a small percentage of the people that really need it uh, get it. You say, I mean, why is the case? The part of the reason is that many of these patients may be a little older and the risk may be a little higher and the surgeons and the patient do not want to go through that. Or sometimes is that they might be underdiagnosed there's a, might be a murmur in an 80 something, uh, 80 something year old patient. And the doctor said, well, you know, just a murmur, I've been there many years and sort of, uh, sort of ignore that. So therefore, even with uh, good surgery, certainly uh, quite under, under treated, uh, under diagnosed. So in 2012, FDA approved this procedure called transcatheter aortic valve replacement. 
essentially is using a catheter, a tube that we can mount a valve on and change the valve through the leg. And this is really um, a sort of a groundbreaking procedure because it is for the first time uh, we can change something that big in the heart without have to um, open up the chest. So this transcatheter aortic valve replacement, as you can see in this little cartoon here, is inserting the catheter and the valve through the femoral artery, which is the artery that supplies blood to the leg. And I'll show you a little bit more detail what this valve, what this procedure looks like. Obviously much less invasive uh, with this aortic stenosis because it's catheter based. So the heart is beating, the patient is sort of not really under general anesthesia, local anesthesia and sedation. The heart is not stopped, so therefore it's no hot lung machine, no ventilator. And we will insert a new valve within your old valve. The old valve is actually serve a very important, important purpose because the old valve is thickened and hardened. So when you put a new valve inside it and you open it up, the old, the old valve is actually served as a scaffold to hold a new valve. It's like the corrugated wall on a, you know, a, a rock uh, and you essentially you put the valve there with a stainless steel cage, it prevents it from moving. Again, I'll show that a little later. And usually it's a one night stay in the hospital, you, no recovery time, you pretty much the next day going home, you can do everything you wanna do. And the procedure is about one hour. And the risk of the procedure compared to surgery is about 50% less. So majority of the time, uh, patients have very little complication and essentially felt like, you know, they can just go on and much better within a day or two. So let me see whether I can play this here. So essentially, if you look at a transcatheter aortic valve replacement, we access the leg through a small incision and then through that incision, we introduce a little tube. This tube is approximately um, five to six millimeters in diameter. And then through this, uh, this, this what we call a, sh a sheath, we can introduce a little wire and a little tube essentially can let us go through the aorta. The aorta is much bigger than this cartoon and allow us to go backwards through the valve. And this is the disease aortic valve. And we do a procedure sometimes, and nowadays a lot of times we may not do it at all, is using a balloon to first stretch open the valve so that we can prepare the aortic valve to uh, have the new valve inserted. But now the new valve is so good that we don't, and so small that we don't even need to do the balloon first. So this just illustrates to you the valve is crimped down, is pushed smaller on top of a balloon. So through the same little wire that we have thread through the valve, the stents, valve now is put into the old valve. And then we make the heart beat a little faster so that the heart doesn't move. And then we open up the balloon and this valve is stretched back to its original shape and left alone in there. And then we take out everything. So this actual part of the procedure may be about 10 minutes um, to 15 minutes. And the rest is preparing the leg to, to sort of uh, insert the valve. So this is the new um, valve and valve leaflets are inside this cage. So that is sort of now allows the blood essentially go through unimpeded. The old valve is staying outside, holding the new valve. So let me illustrate with a real patient. So this is a patient we did a couple of years ago. I'm sorry, a couple of weeks ago. Sorry. So this is an 88 year old Asian woman, uh, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, um, have GI bleeding um, because this sometimes can happen in patients with aortic stenosis. They have a, a concurrent problem in the gut that uh, create little blood vessels and have more tendency to bleed. Has shortness of breath and leg swelling. So she was discovered to have aortic stenosis with a pressure gradient between a valve of 50. Remember we said 40 or above is critical or severe. So she has severe aortic stenosis. The heart, fu heart function is still normal. The ejection fraction, which is a measurement of how well the heart pumps, is within normal range of uh, 55, 60 to about 70. So, and we also check whether the leg arteries are big enough to introduce this valve. So the two pictures here shows you the uh, sort of, this is real person in a CAT scan. You can see this is the top down view of the valve. So the valve is this three pieces there and the white part, white pieces are the calcium that has been built up in the valve. And the, the, the orange part, these are the coronary arteries that supply blood to the heart. 
So this is a, a way that we can measure the size of the valve, what size do we need? And also um, to out, allow us to measure some more details, are there any risk of these calcium breaking off? Are these calcium could crack? So many things that we do technically. This is also a CAT scan of the leg artery. And you can see that there's some tortuosity, some turning. But if it's very, very turned and hardened, sometimes the catheter could have a hard time trend, uh, going through this uh, aorta. So that we also do the CAT scan to determine how's the path going from the leg to the heart. We don't want it to be lumbar street because you know then it will be very hard for us to um, steer the valve uh, into the heart. So let me show you this is actual patient. This patient again, um, now what we're doing is under X-ray, um, what we call fluoroscopy, we can now sort of look at how we uh, place the valve. So this is a patient, this is the spine, this is a heart there. It's, you can see that something is moving, is beating, but obviously the heart is uh, transparent to X-ray, meaning that X-ray cannot see the heart unless we give a dye. And if you give dye, then the, the that part of the heart that has, has the dye filling it will become black because the X-ray won't go through it. So this is a little catheter that we place in the top part of the valve. So the valve is sitting right where my arrow is. And then we give some dye to locate the valve and also measure the size a bit as well as measure the location that we want to put the valve in. So this shows up in black here as a coronary artery. So this particular procedure allow us to really locate the valve, determine where it should be the valve be placed. On the right panel here now, you can see at the actual valve. So the, this little catheter is still there to tell us where the position should be. And this is the valve mounted inside a cage called a stent. And this is the catheter that we use to push the valve into it. So this is approximately you know, five to six millimeters. And so we try to use a die to determine where's a good spot to put this valve. And the little dot is the middle of the uh, valve. So we want to put it in a certain location. So then we make the heart beats a little faster. So you can see the heart beat faster than before using a special pacemaker. And then we'll play it again. So you can see we open up a balloon the balloon stretch open the valve, which is inside, and then we deflate the balloon and the valve will work right away. So the actual deployment of the valve it may take you know, 10 seconds to 15 seconds. So once we open it up, we deflate the balloon and take everything out. So the valve will stay behind. As you can see in this picture, the valve is left behind just like the cartoon I showed you. The valve, you cannot see itself because it is, you know, again, a tissue. Therefore, you cannot see the valve, but you can see that the blood is going forward. The dye is being washed out. And we measure the pressure difference between the two sides. Remember when it was abnormal, the, the pressure difference is about 50 millimeters in this particular patient. But now when we finish, we put a new valve in there's no pressure difference as like a normal valve because there should be no pressure difference on the left ventricle on this side to the aorta on this side. We also give dye on both the valve to make sure there's no leakage because in the older generation, sometimes there's um, sort of cracks outside the valve between the new valve and the old valve, there's little crevices. And those crevices can allow blood to leak back into the left, left ventricle. So the, these, new, sorry, these new valves have actually some uh, a skirt that's made of tissue that will actually um, attract blood and then clot a little bit and prevents blood from leaking backwards. So if you see blood leaking backwards, you'll see dye floating backwards into the left ventricle. But here, there's none. So this is a very successful procedure for this 88-year-old uh, woman and basically stayed overnight. And then she went home the next day and pretty much returned back to normal activity that you know the next day, afternoon or evening. We finally also do a procedure, a, a check, make sure that the, the, the femoral arteries are not injured because we put a pretty big catheter in there. You can see there's a slight narrowing on this side. This is where we make the cut and introduce the catheter. Usually that would just heal up fine once the suture is gone. So what does this uh, procedure treatment wise do to the patient? Um, we can say, well, everybody needs it, but that's we need to, to measure it. We need to do clinical studies for it. So on the left panel here, this is the very early study, essentially comparing standard therapy, meaning in patients that are pretty high risk for uh, aortic uh, surgery. Um, at that time, there's really no operation, no, no option for them, just taking some medicine and just wait. 
at the, the so the early study we um, sort of randomized. We select half the patient randomly and do the TABR, and the other ones just continue medical therapy. Essentially, would decrease the um, incidence of death from any any cause by fifty percent. This is over two years. So these are very sick patients already because they are uh, felt by the surgeon to be inoperable. Um, but even in these patients, when we put the valve in, they live uh, much longer, much better quality of life as shown on the right panel here. This is a measurement of pre and post, how well people feel. And if you look at um, the um, sort of what we call the KCCQ score, essentially patient pre taver have a score about 45 and they increase quickly within 30 days to 81, so almost doubling sort of their measurement of quality of life. And then, um, you know, at one year, it increased even further. So quickly, you can see the quality of life of these patients uh, improve significantly as well. So you may think that, you know, by now, in, you know, in after maybe, you know, a decade of uh, the transcatheter valve technology, most people that have aortic stenosis will get treatment. But you can see that when it was first released, only 4% of the patients that should have aortic replacement got TABR. Um, obviously, over time, it increased about 20% in 2016. So over time, as doctors are trained, as patients understand this procedure, as the technology get better, better and better valve, smaller and smaller and smaller catheter, more and more people are basically um, getting treatment with uh, the TABR procedure. The surgical numbers have diminished, and actually in the United States now, many more patients are treated by this uh, TABR procedure than by surgery. So if you don't need any other surgery, bypass operation, other valve problem, the standard treatment now for age 65 and above in the U.S. is the TABR procedure. But interestingly, as just like many things, uh, there's issue of race and ethnicity in terms of whether you get to do have the procedure done. For example, in average, the black patients are 24% less uh, likely to receive a tablet, maybe because of access, maybe because of uh, you know issue of understanding the pr uh, procedure. But you can see here uh, whether it's surgical or tablet is still significantly less than um, the white population. And if you look at, uh, you know, uh, overall in terms of uh, looking at, uh, uh, it's hard to see underneath here, one second, that if you compare sort of white, black, Asian, and other, uh, majority of the patient getting tablet are still white. Um, and you can see Asian represents relatively small population, similarly Hispanic and non-Hispanic. So there's really obviously an issue of, uh, of access, race, and understanding the procedure. So I think that's really still a big barrier for us uh, in that our Asian community to really ex explain this procedure better and help us and help people understand uh, that this is actually a, a very a relatively simple procedure. There's access for patients easily uh, on average age is 80 plus and our oldest patient that we've done is 102. As usual, again, women are generally treated uh, less often with tablet procedure or surgical procedure, and usually later than men. Again, symptoms sometimes could be a, a, a issue, as uh, so they can sometimes present with what we call low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. The heart is weakened, and the valve never generate enough. The heart never generate enough pressure to reach that number forty, for example. But nevertheless, I think you know we are now aware of these conditions and pay more attention when women come in for this type of procedure. So the challenge that we want to sort of uh, get you all aware of is really this patient care pathway um, that we don't want to lead to uh, unnecessary delays and untreatment. So patients need to be aware of this condition, recognize if, there is, if they've been told that they have a heart murmur and they have noticed some of the decreased activity that they are you know, seeing, whether it is some shortness of breath or fatigue, that they should contact their doctors and have it evaluated whether they have um, aortic stenosis and how severe. And obviously, detect and diagnosis of stress on the physician. So uh, expert auscultation, listening to the heart, as well as the echocardiography uh, interpretation, measuring those gradient, the pressure difference is very important. And they have to be done well because it's very easy to miss some of these gradient. And you can get a low number while the real number is actually quite high. Then depends on where you are and how well the center has been doing this procedure. Um, you know, if it's not locally available or locally uh, available, but relatively new, then I think for patients, they should con consider going to other other more experienced center for to be evaluated and see whether they're a candidate. 
So again, um, this procedure is now really worldwide available. Um, and certainly more than 400, more than half a million now. A patient worldwide has been treated with uh, this particular catheter, but there's other brands that are also being uh, used to do so. So probably more than now close to you know, 750,000 or so and available pretty much uh, in most countries. And now, you know, the approval, as I said, is first approved in 2011, 2012 in U.S. So I showed you one valve. This is one type of valve. We in the U.S. use two major type. This is called the Edward Sapien valve. And essentially, I show you there's a cage of uh, metal. It's like a stent um, that can be stretched open, the valve sitting inside. And the, mo the most latest iteration called the Sapien 3 Ultra, I have this little cuff outside to prevent leakage through the crevices available in four sizes. So it's, it, it, we have to really be careful to picking the right size because that will help us um, really prevent leakage and making sure the valve works well. There's another uh, 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 system that is a self-expanding system. This is a valve that basically opens by itself. And once you unsheathe the uh, catheter, so it sits inside the aortic valve and pushes out and the valve is inside. So this is called the Evolute system by Medtronic. So who is eligible? You may ask, you know, am I too old? Am I too weak? Am I too, you know, um, you know uh, frail? So obviously, a, a expert evaluation by a heart team is the most important. Um, but as I said before, age is not the limit. There are many patients that are in the 90s that really uh, still have a good quality of life or had good quality of life and with aortic stenosis has decreased. So I think this is important and essentially getting a good evaluation is very uh, the first step. Um, and again, you should, in the old days, the first one, this is approved is really for patients that are not eligible for surgery. Then it then it goes to patients that are high risk. They are traditionally um, high risk for open procedure. Then it moved to intermediate risk and now low risk. So essentially anybody that aortic stenosis that is uh, severe enough to warrant a valve change, uh, as long as they're over age 65, they're eligible. Their patient, obviously, under 65 can also be treated with TAPR. Um, the reason that we sort of have cut off or the FDA has a cut off 65 is that the younger you get any of these, these tissue valve, including surgical tissue valve, don't have a lifespan of about 10 to 15 years. That means that, you know, if you are younger than 65, very likely that you might need another valve procedure. So they want us to be careful and think through it. How do we um, have a lifetime strategy for patients with aortic stenosis and not just looking at one valve, maybe multiple valves. How do we do multiple valves? So again, this is uh, that's my talk and um, you can find more information in whether it's American Heart Association. Um, this is the company, a, a, a website called Mended Heart, American College of Cardiology, talk about heart valve disease and uh, you know obviously many other uh, sites as well in terms of uh, looking at heart valves. And uh, certainly, well, uh, happy to um, answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yan. It was such an excellent talk. Uh, it was truly wonderful. Um, as a general cardiologist, you know, uh, I really find this uh, technology really revolutionary. You know, I remember back in the days when I first came out of fellowship, like, you know, uh, 15, 16, 17 years ago, uh, it's often a very difficult discussion when you have someone, you know, who has severe symptomatic aortic stenosis and they're 90, 91, 92, and, uh, or even, you know, in the upper 80s, like no one would touch them. And it's so hard to talk to these patients and talk to their family about there's very little we can do for these patients. Uh, and this procedure really revolutionized the, uh, the entire landscape of aortic stenosis. So thank you again for the talk tonight. Um, thank you for the audience. We have a very engaging uh, audience tonight. There's a lot of questions. So, so, um, so our first question tonight um, is this one. Once the TARFR is performed, what is the expected life expectancy or longevity of the device operation? Right. So the valve itself is made of either cow or pig um, pericardium. So it's a lining of the heart in the animal and it's sort of cut out as a piece of tissue. So even though our technology nowadays are so good, but we still cannot manufacture tissue that uh, is comparable to, uh, from uh, sort of the biological source. So that tissue generally is clean and then um, treated with uh, uh, pres uh, preservative to sort of really uh, make sure that there's, there's no infection, there's nothing else in there. And then the valve is cut 
uh, into p uh, little valve leaflets and then sewn into this cage. So whether it's surgical or catheter valve, the average age is about 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. Then that valve, unfortunately, will harden again and may not open again. But again, some patients have the valve for 20 years and have no issues. So the, the average age, I would say, between 10 to 15 years. And the younger you are, the more likely the valve would actually calcify because young person's metabolism is a little different and they tend to sort of calcify things. So the younger patients, um, I think, when they're less than 65, there's a discussion of whether they should get a mechanical valve, mechanical surgical valve, because we cannot make a mechanical valve go through a catheter because it's made of um, metal or carbon and fix this. So they have to be open heart, put it in. The downside about that, the good side about it is lasts for a long time. The downside is you have to take a medicine called Coumadin to thin your blood because these metal tissue surface uh, is very attractive for blood to form clots. So therefore you have to take a medicine called Coumadin to thin your blood and you measure your, uh, what we call, you know, INR, so an index of how thin your blood is continuously. And also as a woman, if you are childbearing age, you can't really take Coumadin that, that well. And that's, you know, obviously having a child is very complicated uh, when you're on Coumadin. So tendency now in worldwide is less and less patients are getting the mechanical valve, even when they are younger. The idea is that they might get a reoperation or they will get a tablet valve inside the surgical valve as they get older. So imagine you're 60 years old, you have a surgical valve placed um, because, um, you know, um, they put in surgical tissue valve. It may last you, you know, 15 years. And so now you are 75 and then a valve deteriorated. At 75, we can put a catheter valve inside the surgical valve, so-called valve in valve. So from 75, you buy you another 15 years. So now you're talking about, you know, close to 90 years old. So maybe at 60 years old, you can have surgical about followed by the catheter about. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah. So the next question is uh, it's very similar to what you just described. So let's just go over this one. Um, my 14-year-old son was born with the charter drift below and may soon need a tougher. Uh, can you talk about long-term outcomes? Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's a tough one, you know, 14 years old. What do you think about that one? Hmm? Yeah. So we have done sort of... Uh, catheter about whether it is in a pulmonic position, which is, you know, a, a different valve. And for tetralogy for load, that typically could be the valve that needs to be changed. And there's a special valve made for that called the melody valve, similar concept, but used in a pulmonic position, obviously much less common because congenital heart disease patients are still a uh, relatively small uh, minority, but they can be put in, in that way, similar concept, but in the pulmonic position. Um, but obviously the issue is whether they will last long. And how, how the pulmonic position, uh, fortunately, tends to last longer because there's less pressure damaging the valve because the pulmonic pressure is much lower. So tendency is that it may last longer. Okay, yeah. And this one's similar too. Uh, is there a, a age cutoff that TARFR is no longer appropriate or not recommended? Yeah. We talk a little bit about the younger age. Um, you know, certainly we have the average age of many of these tablet procedures when it's age um, 80 plus. Um, and therefore, we have done patients that are 100 years old plus, um, mm. and, but they have to be pretty healthy and pretty strong. Um, but, you know, um, so there's really no physical limits in terms of the age. It's really the quality of life the patient has. So obviously there are patients that are you know, much younger, but they are now bed bound. They have other conditions that make them really um, don't do very much. Then a tablet procedure is probably not appropriate because it's not going to make them any better if they have other conditions that limit their physical activity and their cognitive function, for example. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of the audience of this example, um, so um, it says if you already have two surgical aortic bag replacement procedures, and have a cardiomyopathy. Um, how does that change the risk and the success rate uh, for the outcome for the tougher procedure? Yeah, so I presume obviously the the, the devil is in the detail here. So if you have mm -hmm. uh, the the heart muscle is uh, is weakened for a long time already, and it's a primary problem, uh, that obviously is a separate issue. But if the heart muscle is is weakened because the surgical valve has been failing and that we have evidence that the heart muscle can recover, we can change the or in, put a new valve into the surgical valve. We can put in what we call valve-in-valve, put a, a tablet valve inside a surgical valve. Uh, 
um, get rid of whether it's a leakage, whether it is not opening, um, the heart muscle may get stronger and improve on it. So, but unfortunately, uh, much more detail need to be determined whether there's permanent damage to the heart muscle from other reasons, or is it really related to the valve? The more is it related to the valve, the more likely that the heart muscle will improve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, and isn't the uh, the diagnosis for severe aortic stenosis in cardiomyopathy sometimes a challenge too? Can you comment yeah. on that too? Yeah. So um, as I recall, uh, I explained that you know the number forty four zero is when there's a normal heart, normal left ventricle pumping the blood and generate pressure difference between the two sides. So imagine the heart is weakened; it's not pumping so much blood each beat. Therefore, by just um, sort of equation or just the nature of blood flow is that if it squeezed much weaker, the gradient, the number 40 will be lower because there's not much blood flow across the valve. You can take it to extreme. A person is, you know, obviously in diet straight, pumping very little blood, five cc's of blood. There'll be no pressure difference on either side because both sides will be low mm. and therefore no more gradient. So the criteria of 40 is assuming the left ventricle is normal. So if the left ventricle is not normal, then we have to um, either give medicine to um, strengthen the heart, to test it out, to see whether there's reserve in the left ventricle to pump harder, or uh, we can also do some other sort of, um, uh, you know, CAT scan, other things to look at the valve. Is it really disease or is it the valve looks okay, but the heart muscle is not pumping. Hmm. So more yeah. tests to do that. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, we have some questions about, um, you know, the Asian population. So someone is interested to know among the 2,600 procedures uh, of TARFERS that were done at Stanford, approximately how many of these uh, Asian American patients? And how do you think the uh, those populations are uh, taking on the concept? Right. So um, I think it's, it's uh, you know, the general numbers, I would say Stanford about 20%, which is quite high compared mm. to many of our sister uh, institutions across the country because we have a you know relatively large Asian population. And I define that uh, as obviously, you know, uh, Asian, not just Chinese, not just Japanese, but pretty much from uh, South Asian, Filipino, everything included, everybody included. Um, generally, the size is a little smaller, but the arteries surprisingly are not smaller. So, um, you know, most of the time we can fit the catheter valve in and we can uh, select valve in, uh, big enough or small enough to um, treat these patients. So in general, they actually tolerate the procedures very well, uh, as I've shown in my example, the 88-year-old um, Asian patient. So um, I think what is missing a lot of times is that maybe the Asian patient uh, never heard about this procedure or scared of any procedures that may be related to open heart or heart operation. So that's why I think a, a talk like this, uh, hopefully, uh, whether it's today or whether it's on YouTube, will be helpful to reassure people that this is a very safe uh, procedure across um, all ethnicity and pretty much all across all age group. Obviously, uh, in terms of uh, you know the risk is uh, is relatively acceptable. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. And uh, someone asked the question of uh, just an interesting one. When I never thought of that. Um, with tougher, what actually holds the valve in place? So if you imagine the original or the old valve that is diseased, that is has thickened, has calcified. So if you look inside the valve, if you have a normal valve, it's very smooth tissue, you know. But if you look at the diseased valve, you cut it out, it's really uh, bumpy. And a lot of bumps are little nodules of calcium. And the nodules of calcium are irregular. And some place could be pretty sharp. So imagine if you're putting the new valve in, you push this valve out, that surface that is irregular is actually locking the new valve in, in a, in a, circ in a, in a circ circumference, right? So three leaflets are pushed up, new leaflet, new valve sit inside and the calcium, all that is holding it. Also the valve is, is uh, sized very carefully to match the size of the, what we call the annulus where the valve is. Too small, it will fly, right? No matter how much, valve tissue is there to hold it. Too small, there's not enough force to hold it. Too big, a problem is that you can crack the uh, where the valve sits and cause a perforation or opening of that area. So that's why the CAT scan is very important for us to do it before the procedure to carefully determine the size of the uh, annulus. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, wonderful, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's look at this question. Um, there was a uh, question about, uh, mitral valve um, 
uh, treatment uh, by catheter. So um, would you comment on the clinical trial going on yeah. to uh, replace or repair the mitral valve by uh, catheter? Is there such a thing? Or is yeah. it only so for the AOA EMDR is, is a, a, a new research area. One area that we are doing and a fair amount of uh, centers are doing already is that if you have a surgical mitral valve than before, it's pretty easy for us to put a, a TAVR valve into the surgical mitral valve. It's a valve in valve in, because you have a scaffold of the mitral valve holding that new valve. The native mitral valve is a complex structure. The aortic valve is pretty simple, a ring, and then you have three leaflets. The mitral valve is like a saddle, has a three-dimensional nature to it. And there's a, a, a lot of soft tissue, harder tissue. So very difficult to put a valve in that is circular into a saddle. So the, the newer technology to uh, look at this is sort of a, um, it's like a whole apron of a valve to put in the mitral position. So that's being sort of investigated. The system is still too big to go through the groin and they're miniaturizing it to be small enough to go through the leg. Right now, some of the research finishing up is go through the, 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 the tip of the heart. So they have opened up the um, side of this of the chest, locate where the heart is and push put a hole in it and put the valve in. But that obviously had risk because it's in a general seizure that has to be making a hole in the heart that can bleed in, in older patients and so forth. So transcatheter mitral valve replacement is coming, uh, but it's harder than uh, aortic valve and being studied uh, pretty hard right now. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. And uh, and there are also these trans... Um... Apical approach for TARFR too, right? And uh, so is that, is that not common anymore? Uh, no, how yeah. frequent that it was is? the original when we first developed um, CAVR because the catheter is so big, a lot of the uh, femoral arteries would not take that valve, mm -hmm. would not take the catheter. So we have to f find a different way to put in, but much more risk bleeding. The heart suture doesn't take, remember these are older patients. The mm -hmm. tissue could be very uh, weak, very soft, and they actually don't hold sutures very well. So uh, pretty much transapical tabra is gone. Just too much risk and too uh, uh, you know uh, much too many complications. Uh, yeah, it's good news for patients. So most yeah. you know pretty much all of these patients can be done through the leg artery. So that's good news for everyone. Yes. Yeah. All right. So um, I think we uh, cover most of these questions. If you can just uh, let me just take a last peek on the um, on the on the. Uh, webinar chat. So uh, is Tarver valve a pure mechanical device? Um, would you take on that one? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So the Tarver valve is really the cage is metal, but inside is just the um, animal tissue valve. So essentially it's similar to a surgical, what we call bioprosthesis is a biological tissue valve. Mechanical valve typically is used to reserve to describe the valve leaf that's are made of metal. Uh, mm -hmm. or carbon uh, uh, fiber material, for example. So that that will be called mechanical valve. Mechanical valve, as I said before, needs much higher level of, of blood thinning because blood tends to uh, form clot on these tissue. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, during TARFR, is there a chance the procedure can break loose the uh, calcified deposits on the aortic valve and, you know, embolize somewhere, right. you know? In the brain or right. something. So mm -hmm. this was one of the fear in the original concept. It's like, you know, you're breaking apart this valve and pieces come off and shower to the head and everywhere and causes big strokes and so forth. It turns out when we did the procedure in the beginning, uh, the incidents are pretty small, one to 2%. Um, and, but despite that, people would say, well, can we improve it? So there's actually a device in, in, in invented. It's called, um, it's, a, it's a filter system that put in the neck arteries. Uh, it's called Sentinel, um, a brand name. Essentially, a little fishnet that has little holes that let blood go through, but doesn't allow debris to go through. So the concept sounds great, but in clinical trials, it doesn't seem to make a big difference. Um, they caught something, but most of the time, when you have good circulation in the brain, the brain can tolerate some of the little tissue and nothing happens. So uh, it's still that uh, we think you don't really, really need the Sentinel um, cerebral protection device. Uh, you can do it without it, but in some patients, we choose to do so. It's still an area of research. Got it. Okay. And then, um, wow, there's still a lot of questions coming in, so I have to be a little bit more selective for the last few minutes. Um, can a smartwatch detect aortic stenosis? 
Well, the, uh, hopefully a smartwatch is pretty smart, but not smart enough yet to <laughs> be able to detect uh, aortic stenosis. It, Maybe in the future, I can see right? that a smartwatch in some way can detect a heart murmur, a sound of that such nature, but it's going to be pretty hard for it to detect the severity of the aortic stenosis. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Right. Okay. Um, there's a lot of questions. I think you probably answered that already. There's a lot of questions regarding like, you know, what is the oldest age? And, you know, uh, I think you already answered that question, right? Yeah. How old a patient can be for considered renal tougher. Yeah. So uh, as long as the patient is healthy enough, right? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I see How about question someone with... Say, yeah. It's a heart working too hard. I was uh, thinking about that when um, causing uh, this disease. It's not heart working too hard. It's just heart working normally. Um, and the valve is somewhat a little bit um, maybe asymmetrical, other reasons or risk factors. So some people say, well, argue that you only have a certain number of heartbeats per life, meaning whatever years you have. So therefore you, you want to save it. That's people who doesn't want to exercise. I heard many <laughs> excuses that, you know, I don't want to exercise because I don't want to waste my heartbeats. But there's really no such thing as the heart is an organ that needs to be exercised. So I don't think the, the, the heart beats uh, is an issue. So the heart is working too hard, not because it wor is working too hard. It's working too hard because of the aortic stenosis. And therefore, it has no choice. It's not like it, it can choose to not work hard. Because if it doesn't work hard in an aortic stenosis situation, then the heart failed. So the heart has no choice but to pump against this hole, so a smaller hole, to keep the person alive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I have one last question. Uh, this one's for myself. So... Uh, is there any hope in the future that this technology can be extended to patients with severe aortic regurgitation? And uh, and if not, then what would be the um, you know the difficulty? Yeah. So actually, this this technology Taber originally was actually invented with the idea of maybe it can fix the aortic uh, regurgitation. Hmm. So that's okay. why it's the second valve that has a longer cage to sort of sort of locked into the bigger part of the aorta. Uh, because they was also thinking about, that's possible to put an aortic stenosis, cal valve to calcify, the valve won't work. So that was the original concept. Mm -hmm. So if you have pure aortic regurgitation, there are some newer valves that probably would do better than what we have, the two of them we have now. Mm -hmm. But if you have a combination of aortic stenosis, meaning the valve is thickened and you are leaking as well, then TAB is fine. Um, the reason is that there are, aortic there are some aortic regurgitation patients, typically younger, the valve is completely pristine. It just won't close. There was, there's a hole in it. Then putting a valve in has nothing to hold it, right? There's no calcium nodule, no thickening, and the valve, every heartbeat will leave. Hmm. Yeah, got it. Hmm. Wonderful, yeah. Well, Dr. Aaron, yeah, this is a wonderful talk and wonderful discussion after the talk. So I think uh, a lot of us have learned so many new things tonight. I, uh, I want to thank you for the time tonight and your presentation. And thank you for doing this uh, medical procedure for many of the patients we have at Stanford. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. And thank you for the team for organizing this. And thank you for the audience uh, being so actively asking questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you for attending. Uh, good night.